So here I, I it's just kind of been in, ingrained into me. So maybe you kids are listening to this and you're going to learn about purpose clauses and then someday in 20 years you'll be up preaching and I'll be listening and I'll be like, oh, yeah, let's go, purpose clauses. So what is a purpose clause? So I want to illustrate a little bit before we get into these 12 purpose clauses about kind of what a purpose clause is and what the function is. So I would like, is there a kid who can tell me what they're, what they're wanting for Christmas? Yes. What do you want for Christmas, Tyler? You want a computer. Okay. Why do you want a computer? This is important for a purpose clause. So you want a computer, why? Because I want to play Minecraft. All right, because he wants to play Minecraft. We're uh, evangelizing the world slowly, but we'll get there. Uh, yeah, so he wants you, that. So he's got a reason. He wants something, and then he's in control to make that purpose clause happen. So if he gets a computer, the purpose is so he can play Minecraft. So Minecraft is the clause of the sentence structure, the purpose being behind why he gets the computer. So somebody else. It doesn't have to be a kid this time. Somebody else who wants. Oh, yeah, Jackson, what do you want for Christmas? You want a video game. Why do you want a video game? You can play whatever you want. So you want to, he, a video game enables him to then play something on it. So there's a purpose clause there. An adult, this will be our last one. An adult, what do you want for Christmas? Chocolates. <laughs> why, do you, why do you want chocolates? Because there could be a lot of reasons. Maybe you want to give it to some orphans out there. Or maybe you want to share with your husband or share with your pastor. No, so what's, what, what's the purpose behind? Because you, you want to eat it. All right. So the purpose, I want chocolate. So why? So that... She can eat it. So all these purpose, most of the time, purpose clauses in the Bible are really easy to see because there's a key phrase there, so that. Um, now, there will be other purpose clauses that don't always use those. In our English language, typically we use so that. Um, so there will be some purpose clauses that are not in that Bible, but a lot of times they are so that. So as we go through here, you're going to try and find the so that's in John 17, and there's a lot of them. And I was like, as I got to the, like seven, I was like, oh, this is perfect. There's seven of them. It's going to be the perfect number. And then we got to... 10. I was like, okay, look, 10's nice, and it's a, not really a God number so much, but it's an English number. We like 10, you know, the top 10 list. And then it kept going. I was like, 11. And then, oh, well, it'll get to 12, and that'll be, you know, God's number again. No, it stopped at 11. And I was like, oh, okay. But there's a really good purpose clause in John 16 that we'll start with, so we can get a nice number 12. Now, I realize that this is not a very Aussie-friendly sermon. Okay, I get that. Now, Jesus was preaching in a different context. If he was preaching in Australia, he probably would have had a different way of preaching this sermon. This is, the, this is the high priestly prayer. So he's about to go on trial, about to go to the cross to die for the sins of the world. The purpose behind that is that's why we have Christmas. The purpose behind Christmas is so that he could go to the cross and save us from our sins. If you don't listen to anything else, that's the main thing to get out of Christmas. Uh, but so we, he's, he's got these... All these purpose clauses, now typically for uh, us as Aussies, we like to, to comprehend sermons in very uh, sharp ways. It's got to be like one sentence, one profound thought, one overall goal, and we get that and we like to chew on that. And so when there's 12, it's like, oh, that's too much, bro. That's too much thinking. We're not in school, so I realize it's going to be hard, which I try to condense into basically three points here, and we'll see how we go. If you get through this and you're paying attention, then extra spiritual points to you. May God bless you <laughs> richly this week. All right, let's go to, to the first one here in John chapter 16. This is how chapter 16 finishes as he goes into the high priestly prayer. These things I have spoken to you so that, our first purpose clause, so why is Jesus speaking these things to us and to you today? So that in me you may have peace. And you may have heard this, phrase, this verse before. It's a pretty popular verse. In the world you have tribulation. But take courage, I have overcome the world. Now we got 12 of these, and so I don't want to camp on any one of them for like 30 minutes. But this one's really, really cool and really, really important. Where is the peace found? In Christ. So he, he's giving you words, not just so that you can go home and I can feel at peace in all my life. If I get my Christmas lights in order, I get my Christmas presents in order, I mean, that's one of the most stressful things about Christmas is finding gifts for everybody, right? Like, you start to dread it. November comes around, you're like, oh, my goodness. And I know some of y'all, y'all start, start stacking up in June, July. You know, you're like, oh, this is great. It's on sale. We'll start getting these Christmas in. And then what happens? 
then you forget about it, and you bought double presents, and then you're stressed out because you have too many presents for people. You know what I'm saying? And so, like, but the peace isn't found in all the stuff that we do. It's only originally originating from Christ. He has come to speak so that we might believe in Him, and then in Him we have peace. In the world you have tribulation. Yes, we understand that. We can attest to that. But take courage. I love this phrase for Jesus. I've overcome the world. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. Overcome death, Satan. There's literally nothing in this world that Jesus is like, yeah, I beat that. I'm bigger than it. I've overcome it. Whatever you can think of. Jesus is like, I've overcome the whole thing. And you could even uh, attest, you can even expound on this, taking a little leap out of the context to say, overcome the whole universe. It's not like you get to, if you're one of those few lucky people that get to go to Mars someday, and then, oh, Jesus didn't overcome anything in this world. No, no. It's the, the, your text is implying that he's over everything. So take courage. Like, this is what's so crazy is there's a lot of people out there, when you listen to, uh, there's a lot of these self-help, self uh, motivating speakers that go to conferences that, you know, you got to believe in yourself, you think highly, and then you can do it. The only thing that's stopping from you and glory and fame and riches, you got to do the work. You work hard enough and your dreams can come true. And it's basically a lot of rubbish. <laughs> and Jesus says, you don't have to worry about that. I've already overcome it for you. And so we can experience peace and we can experience courage in Christ. In fact, I would argue because of this text the world can't experience peace or courage because they don't have Christ. Now, they think they do. They think they'll have moments of peace and moments of all be brave, but that's not the same thing as having courage. I can launch into the courage that says, even if it all fails, it doesn't really fail because Christ can never fail. Like, I'm never going to be in the loser category because Jesus overcomes it all. So that's our first one. And this is, we're going to keep tracking through this. So if you're taking notes, great. If you're not, good luck remembering 12 points. Uh, John chapter 17, verse 1. So he just said that. And then Jesus spoke these things. And lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, now he's praying a prayer to God. And all of this in the context of him and his prayer to God. But you actually show up in this. Okay? So literally Kevin is in this prayer. Literally you are in this prayer. It's really cool. Not many parts of scripture you actually show up. Because most of the time he's talking to his disciples or the Pharisees or whatever. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you. So here is the overarching premise, which the rest of the chapter flows through, which says, God's, I love the circular reasoning here. Hey, you glorify me, God, and then I'll glorify you. And that's a little bit sketchy theology sometimes. Like it sounds almost like a prosperity. Hey, God, you give to me. Give me a million dollars, and then I'll give you something back. God, you, you do what I want to do in life, and then I'll do this, right? It doesn't really work for us because we're human beings and we're sinful. We don't have the perspective that Jesus has. But Jesus has a perfect perspective all the time. And he knows, technically, he's God asking God so he can get away with that. I can't really do that. God, give me a red Lamborghini, and then I will give someone a, a little uh, Hot Wheels car, you know. And, and God's like, no, no, Kevin. You don't get to make the terms and conditions. But because Jesus is God, he can make the terms and conditions. And what's also super cool is the circular reasoning that the more God is glorified, the more Christ is glorified. The more that Christ is glorified, the more God is glorified. It actually builds on itself. Whereas when I have circular reasoning, it always, most of the time it degrades itself. It's like, all right, I'll love my wife if she loves me back. And that only ends in a negative cycle. Um, and so with God, we can have these positive cycles that are building on themselves so that the Son may glorify you. So this is the overarching context to everything is that Christ has glory that stems from God. And I know you, some of the kids are here, what are we talking about? I mean, I don't understand what we're talking about. That's okay. We're going to get to that. Some, some amazing, super cool stuff here uh, in, in a second. But basically glorify just means like this excellence, this beauty, this wonder, this aweness, this awesomeness of God. All right, so here we go. Uh, so that's the overarching premise of what he's doing. Glorify uh, glorify Jesus so that Jesus can glorify God. Verse 2. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh. So God has given Jesus, abs he's the absolute boss. If you kids have ever played a, ga a video game, you come to you know the boss level. Jesus is the boss of bosses. He, no one can beat the boss level of Jesus. Even when you think you've died and he comes back to life again, you're like, imagine playing a video game and you finally beat the biggest boss of all time. And then he just comes back to life. And you're like, oh, man, goodness. He can just keep doing that. 
Even if you keep killing Jesus, he keeps coming back to life. Not that he's going to die again, but if he did, he could be able to keep coming back to life. But why, why does Jesus have authority over all flesh, over every human thing, every created thing? To all whom you've given him, he may give eternal life. This is amazing. If you had all authority, what would you do? It probably wouldn't be, let's save the whole world. My first thought is I have all authority. It's 100% a selfish thought. Oh, I could buy an island and live on it by myself. I could buy a country and I could, be, I could rule it. I could buy myself a new house. I could fix my plumbing problem. I could do whatever I wanted to with all my authority. I'm not thinking I want to sacrificially give up my life so that everybody else can be saved. Now, maybe you thought that thought. Maybe you should be preaching. <laughs> This is amazing. So he gave his all authority not so that he could rule over us and destroy us, not so he could judge us, but so that he might save us. Why do we do Christmas? Purpose clause? So that Jesus could bring salvation. And so he's like, God, give Jesus authority so that all who believe in him may have eternal life. All right, we're going to... Um, my notes are not here. Can you go to the next slide here? Oh, I, yes, I can see it there too. So now we're going to skip down to verse 9 and 11. I'm kind of skipping a little of these order, coming back to some of them just to try and keep the flow logical for us. Um, I'm not trying to take verses out of Scripture. I believe they're awesome and everyone's profound. So I ask on their behalf. I love this. He's asking on behalf of the disciples. I do not ask on behalf of the world. So he's praying this prayer for the disciples' sake, not for the rest of the world. He's like, you yeah, know, Hopefully they believe in me, but I really want to pray for the disciples right now. And later he's going to pray for you. I do not ask on behalf of the world. I am no longer in the world. And yet they themselves are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, so that they may be one even as we are. So God, Jesus is praying to God and says, I really, really pray that you will keep them protect them in your name. Which is a really cool thing. Imagine God being up there, yep, all right, we'll protect Kevin, we'll have strongholds, we'll have a fortress. Psalm 18 goes through, you know, the horn of salvation, the shield of, it's not quite called the shield of faith, but there's the shield and on a rock, on a fortress, around a mountain. So it's just all these cool things. Psalm 18 is awesome. And God, Jesus is like, yeah, do all that. Why? So that we may be unified. Oh, that's, I thought that would be more exciting. You know, like, let's protect Kevin. For Kevin's sake, no, let's protect Kevin so he can be friends with everybody else. And we could spend a lot of time on the unity thing, but he's going to do it, so I'm not going to do it because uh, he's going to do this here a bit. Why, what's the purpose of being unified? It's like, why are we preaching on uni unity like when we have the Christmas message right here? And so he's going to talk about, we're going to look at the why and the how. So he's, he wants to protect us so that we may be one, but we don't know the reason why that. So let's go to the next one here. Uh, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word. So he's like, I'm praying not only for the disciples, but for every single one of you as well. Like Jesus is thinking about you as he's praying this prayer. That's super cool. Right before he goes to the cross, he's thinking of all Christians and praying on behalf of all Christians. Father, I pray for them so that they may all be one even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. So he's not just praying that the disciples may be one, but that all of us may be one. And there's a lot of things in the world today that divide us. Now, in fact, I would say even over the last two years, Christians have been more divided over these last two years than probably the previous hundred years. I didn't live before then, so I can't speak. But it was re remarkable that how Christians normally had the same viewpoint that was kind of, opposing what the world generally stood for, and we could generally agree, hey, yeah, murdering people is bad, stealing is bad, and we could agree. But now it's the world's so political and so divided that on things that we have an opinion on, and all of us have a different opinion on something in here, and it's really starting us to, de to degrade our fellowship a lot of times. And God's like, man, you've got to be unified. So he's praying that the disciples are unified, you're unified. Why? That they may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. 
why does Jesus want you to be unified with the person you're sitting next to or the person on the other side of the aisle? It's not really for your benefit. It's so that the world can see those Christians have something that actually makes a difference. Wait, you can be friends with the crazy person you're sitting next to? How does that work? Wait, but they're... Wait, but they're vaccinated or unvaccinated. Wait, but they go to private school or public school. But wait, they they retired. Are they? Wait, they're they're not even from Australia. I was sitting in a pastor's conference, and I think I've shared this already. But someone was like, "Oh, you won't be able to understand him. He's from Gimpy," which is crazy because like I don't have a Gimpy accent. I don't think, but maybe I do. Anyway, so like, and so, but people, the world sees that, and they say, "Well, if Christians can't get along, then what use is Jesus?" That our, one of our greatest evangelism tools is the unification of believers. That we keep the centerpiece, the centerpiece. One of the things that I'm working on with some of the other pastors in the town is I've said, it's been on my heart that we often have a lot of unity in the church, in these four walls, or we'll do other things with other Christians. Like we had some other people from other churches here last night, which was great. And I just loved seeing them because it just gave me a flash forward, kind of like a flashback, flash forward, what heaven's going to be like. Like, I, I had so much fun talking to these other people, even though they go to another church. They're just my brothers and sisters. And uh, even though they, they do things, obviously, a little bit different. And I just said, when the world comes into Gimpy, they just see, like, 15, I think there's 16 churches in the greater region, if, which includes, like, Rainbow Beach and stuff like that. Um, and so the world just sees all these churches, and they're like, oh, this is a bunch of rubbish. None of them can get along. They all have different ways. Like, which one's the real church anyway? And I said, well, I'd love to do a series that we could all do together. Obviously, not all of them are going to do it, but the hope is we get like five, six, or seven churches that could do a, a same book or same series. And each person, they can preach it and do Bible studies and worship however they want to, but we can advertise it on like a billboard and give me that says, the churches of Gimpy are going to the book of Luke. You know, just pick a church, and the world can see that we're unified on a small level. And I'm, there's lots of other things we can do. When we do the Christmas in the park, that can't happen with one church. And we had, you know, two or 3,000 people there. And the world sees that we're unified. And so we're gaining traction in the community. So that, hopefully that keeps going forward. Um, so the world may believe that you have sent me. All right, let's go to the next one here. I and them, you and me, that they may be perfected in unity. Why? So that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So there's an expression out of our unity that's love. That is, that is festered in a good way. Normally festered is not a good sense of the word, but love is, it's slowly growing there, you know? And so, like, it's one thing if we do an event and we're unified, or I can sit next to you and try not to insult, you know, your hairstyle. But if there's not, the unity has to express and grow into a sense of love, which is greater than just being unified. I can be unified with you, but not actually like you. And Jesus is like, that's not really good enough, you know? <laughs> it's not like if I'm like, putting on a smile next to them, and then in my head thinking, oh, man, I hope I never see this person again. <laughs> no, it's the general love. It says, man, I, how can I encourage you? How can I love you? How can I support you? How can I be with you? How can I journey with you and pray with you? As we go into Christmas, I can't, there's a few times of the year where we get together with family, and in all my heart, how can I be unified and love the family? Because we all have, you know, that crazy uncle who you're like, man, we get together with Christmas, and then Uncle Max is there, and everyone's like, he's a bit crazy. And if you don't, then, that, then you're probably the person. You're the Uncle Max then if you don't have one. <laughs> so we've got to be loving each other. All right, so we've, I think we've got one more on the unity thing here. Yes, oh, yeah, this is good. And then we really launch into a lot of purpose here. So 23, sorry, 22, I can't count. The glory which you have given me, I have given them so that they may be one just as we are one. So Christ has been saying, you need to be unified. You need to love each other. I'm thinking, well, how do I do that? Because it's not going to naturally happen. And God's like, I got you covered. Jesus is like, how do we become unified? By experiencing the glory of Jesus. Which is not what I would have expected it to say. I would expect it to say, you know, just really put yourself in their position. You know, just kind of be really empathetic or sympathetic. Or just put yourself out there. Uh, and you'll get to know them, get to know their story. No, no. God's like, you don't have to do anything. I'm doing it. I'm praying that they, that the glory which you have given me, I have given to them. God has already given you 
some glory from Jesus Christ, which enables us to be one. And this is kind of where the, the sermon is going to go in two different directions here. And I've kind of kept two different paths, even though Jesus, he kind of skips over the verses. It gets kind of complicated. But I'm not criticizing how he preaches his sermon, okay? I'm just saying, got some questions. We get to heaven. Jesus, obviously you're on another level than me in preaching sermons. Why are you doing it so complicated? And I'm sure he has a very clear, obvious reason. I'm just not smart enough to realize it yet. But I'm looking forward to having some conversations about preaching philosophy when I get to heaven. So here we go. He's going to talk about the glory train, about why his glory is so miraculous and so marvelous and why it's such a game changer in Christianity, but also the complication that we live in a world that doesn't experience Christ's glory and is not unified and is quite actually full of tribulation. So let's go to the next one. Father, I desire that they also whom you've given me be with me where I am. Go back a phrase. Just so that we don't, I don't want to see it. So he just said, this is, in my opinion, I know I don't have a lot of illustrations today because we've got to go through 12 things. So you're doing a great job. And that's not me patronizing you. I'm being really, really serious. <laughs> Jesus is praying that you be in heaven with him. Now we take it for granted. But maybe there was a world where you don't get to go to heaven. Jesus goes to the cross, forgives you. You don't get to go to hell, and you just become dust. Maybe that was an option. Who knows? But I guess it's hard to speculate of what all the options could have been. But Jesus specifically prays a prayer that those who believe in Jesus may go to heaven. And we're going to have a purpose clause. Why? So that. Why does God want you to go to heaven? So that. See, this is why purpose clauses are so, so important. Well, I'm sure we have all sorts of reasons why we want to go to heaven. So that they may see my glory, whom you have given me. Sorry, which you have given me. For you love me before the foundation of the world. Jesus wants you to go to heaven because he wants you to see his glory. Which is, if I had to ask you, what's the five things you're looking forward to most about heaven or reasons why you want to go to heaven? I don't know if that would have made my list. He's got a mansion for me, streets of gold. It's pretty good. No more pain, suffering, no more crying. It sounds really, really good. Get to be in the presence of God? That's really good, too. Like, those are probably my top five. And Jesus is like, doesn't even mention that. Now, that's still true. Still true, because the Bible says that. But that you may see his glory, and not just a glory. It's that he wants you to see the glory that he had before all this started. Before God created the world, before the foundation of the world, Jesus was so full of awesomeness, He's like, man, no one's here to see this awesomeness, but man, this is awesome. And he's like, I know, we'll create some other people who can enjoy the awesomeness of myself. Now, <laughs> imagine if you said that, or I said that. Hey, why don't you come over to my house so you can experience my awesomeness? And you're like, man, this guy's a fruitcake. <laughs> you're like, I'm not going to his house. <laughs> that sounds pretty sketchy. But Jesus, it's what's so amazing about Jesus is that he's this amazing guy who he is, he can say that, and we know he's not being selfish because he's literally done the most unselfish thing imaginable. He gave his innocent life so that you could live. He came in a manger on a stable. Hey, River, I love you. I love you. <laughs> so we know he's not being selfish because you look what happened here. Is this a guy who's selfish? Who says, it's all about me? No. The guy who gave up his life so that you can live? No. He does it because he knows the best thing for you, you'll be super excited and you'll be full of joy and happiness when you see the glory and awesomeness of Jesus Christ. I was thinking about this concept a lot this week because I was just thinking and one of the carols, I think, had a song and it was talking about how, uh, yeah, it was on Mary Street. Uh, during the thing on Wednesday, and one of these people had a song that just talked about how Jesus is going to be over the governments, and he's going to be king over the government someday. And I was saying, man, that'd be so cool. Like, I was just like, man, Jesus, I can't wait. I'll, I want to be so proud of you that day. And I thought, that's kind of a weird thing for me to say, because it kind of makes me higher than Jesus. You know, like a, it's a parent's proud of their kids. But it can work the other way, too. That we can be proud of people who are above us, too. When I was in, uh, I was 13, and I was playing baseball, for the last, last time because I just wasn't very good. 
And uh, I was the guy who's, please, Lord, don't hit the ball in my direction, okay? I don't want that to happen. Uh, but I was, we were practicing on oval, and it had, a track, it had a, like a track and field track around it. And my dad dropped me off of the practice, and he thought he would do some running. Now, my dad is very fit and very in shape. He does marathons and all that kind of stuff. So he's out there running around the track. And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, that's my dad. He's pretty awesome. And then he stopped after a few laps and then stopped running. And after the practice, I asked, Dad, why did you stop running? Like, I know you're in shape. You can run more than three laps around the track. And he said, well, I just thought that it might be embarrassing for you. And I don't want to I don't want to embarrass you in front of, you know, this, you know, the team or whatever. Because sometimes, you know, middle school kids are, are embarrassed by their parents. Let's just be honest, right? <laughs> and so he just thought that might be the case. I said, no, Dad. I'm there thinking, I'm proud of you. Like, that's my dad running around the track. All you other losers have loser dads. <laughs> that's not quite true. But I was like, my dad will take everybody on, you know. And here he is, he's still, like, he ran a half marathon last week. He's like, oh, I, I ran really slow. I'm kind of disappointed. I'm like, you're like 61, and you're running half marathons, and you're still beating all these other 20-year-olds. Like, it's just amazing. And so I just, like, it's possible for us to have glory and be proud and look forward to someone who's in higher authority finally getting what they deserve. When Jesus finally gets to be on that throne and the culmination of all humanity and all history has led to the moment so that Jesus could be glorified and lifted up, we're not be thinking, oh man, it's a bit of a showboat here. I'll be like, yes, hallelujah, I'm, that's awesome, I want to see that. I'm tired of seeing Jesus in the, in the humble shadows. Maybe that's just me. But I'm like, I want to see you lifted, I want to see you king. Let's go. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, come quickly. And so he says, let's invite these guys and girls to heaven so they can experience the awesomeness that I have for them. The awesomeness that I can show that, no, that people haven't seen. I can't wait to see that. For you have loved me before the foundation of the world. All right, verse 12 here. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. So the disciples are with Jesus. We're moving on here to the next kind of thread outside of the glory. Uh, Jesus was keeping the disciples close, protecting them in a hard world. And I guarded them, and not one of them perished, except for the son of perdition, which in most translations say for the son that was born for destruction or something. I'm talking about Judas. He's like, 11 out of 12 ain't bad, God. 11 out of 12 ain't bad. <laughs> but uh, really what he's saying here is I kept all these disciples and not one of them has something happened to them and they've fallen away. Except for Judas, who was going to happen anyway. So that, why is God looking, Jesus looking to guard you so that the scriptures will be fulfilled? This is why purpose calls are amazing. Because I'm like, what? What does scriptures have to, what does that have to do anything to do with it? I expect Jesus to protect me so that I can you know, come to fruition and, and fill my potential and, and do the ministry that he's called me to do and the great plan that he has for my life. She's like, yeah, no, not really. I can do great plans without you, Kevin. I'm going to guard you. Why? So that he remains faithful. That he has said who he said. God is who he says he is. He's declared in Scripture already the promises over your life and over the disciples' life. And if he doesn't do it, then he, we can call him a liar. Like he's put his own name on the line to look after you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. And so he, he's doing that because he loves you, but also because he has to, because he said he will. And God comes under his own authority, which is crazy. He comes under his own authority and says, I've said this, so therefore I'm going to do it. So the scripture will be f fulfilled that he protects you, which is quite relevant considering what he's going to say in a little bit. But first we have verse 13. This is a bit more of a Christmassy one. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world. Why? So that they may have my joy made full of themselves. I really hope that you have joy at Christmas time. I, I, Joy is one of those perfect words for Christmas time because it's just, we're on, you know, most people are on holidays on some level. Some people it's only two or three days. Rest in peace. <laughs> some, some people get a week, two weeks. Some people take six months off for Christmas, you know. <laughs> but you have joy. And you're, there's family, which is meant to bring joy. There's presents, which are a sign of giving and receiving, which is full of joy. We have Jesus, which is full of joy. Carols, 
Maybe you go to the beach or going camping. But Jesus came to speak words so that they may have joy made full in themselves. There might be joy manifesting out of our lives from the words of Jesus. So what I would encourage you to do is, is this next week, go back over John 17 here and try to find the, the whys in these purpose clauses. Why is it that Jesus' words bring joy? I can't do all of these justice because there's 12 of them and each one of them could be their own sermon. We could have a whole sermon on why Jesus' words bring joy. And so what we do is when we come to a purpose clause so that we have to ask why. What's the connection? Maybe we just meditate on it. Well, what's the connection between your words and joy? Obviously there's a connection because you say it, it's in the formula. And all these in the formulas, you know. What is it about you guarding me has to do with keeping scriptures fulfilled? And I kind of mentioned one of the reasons already, but maybe there's more. Why? Why does unity lead to evangelism? Why? And let's meditate on those things. So the joy made full in themselves. So he's talked about guarding you. He's talked about keeping that you have joy. And you're like, well, that sounds really good. And then we come to verse 15. I do not ask you to take them out of the world but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Jesus is starting to allude that living the world is kind of a bit crummy sometimes. It's not always easy. It's not always fun. And uh, sometimes as Christians, we like to take us, uh, you know what, let's forget the world. Let's go live off, live on a little cabin all by ourselves, not have anything to do with the world. We had a whole way of doing this a couple of millennial ago, uh, and it didn't work. The world needs us in it so that they might be saved. But it's not always easy. Ask all the 11 disciples who had horrible, tragic deaths. And so God's like, I know the world's not fun. I know it's not easy, but you are the means by which, so you're the avenue which God brings the gospel to the lost world. And so to encourage us in a time that is difficult. He says, I will guard you. You can have joy. You can have peace. And obviously, there's purpose because there's all these purpose clauses. Sanctify them, meaning make them holy. Set them apart. As you have sent me into the world, verse 18, I also, there's too many words on that screen. I can't see where I'm at. As you've sent me into the world, I also send them into the world. For their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they themselves might also be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word. So he's talking about you again. Okay, we got to slow down. I, I've been talking way too much theology for a little bit. We're starting to lose people. Not, not you, just others. <laughs> and uh, I, I was thinking, I was like, Lord, there's, got, there's so much theology here. This is not a good one to do without Sunday school or with some, without Sunday school on. So how do we engage the kids? And sometimes, you know, I don't know. So, Lord, we just really pray that you engage with the children in this stuff. Pray that they will get something out of this. And for the adults as well, too. Amen. Uh, this, I love what Jesus is doing here because when you look at these words, there's some contradictions. When you think of contradictions like something that can be hot and cold at the same time. Right? That, that's kind of a contradiction. Or even an odd. It's a contradiction. So Jesus says, I, I want to sanctify them. While they're in the world. So the word sanctify, as I said earlier, means holy slash set apart. You're set apart. So I want you to be in the world, but set apart from the world. Well, that's a bit of a contradiction. Do you want me, me to be sanctified or you want me to be in the world? Yes. No. <laughs> that's hard. To be in the world, but not of the world. To be in the world, but set apart. There's been two times this week that I've mixed oil and water. Not on purpose, but it just, it just happens as you do life, you know. And I get oil on me, and I'm trying to wash it off. And it's hard to wash oil off because you put water on it, and it doesn't go anywhere. They're together, but they don't work, right? Because some of y'all know science more than me. Some of y'all know science more than me. You can probably explain why that doesn't work. But it doesn't work, right? I mean, you're not even looking at me anymore. You're like and so God's, So I think the water and oil is a perfect example of what God is looking. He's like, you're going to be in the world. It's not going to be easy, but be sanctified. Be holy. Be set apart. 
And one of the things I want you to ponder on, because I didn't have time, and I didn't know, I'm not, I couldn't figure out why. Jesus says, I sanctify myself. How, do, how does Jesus make himself more holy? He's already perfectly holy. He's already perfectly sanctified. How can he sanctify himself? So that's a question for some of y'all deep theologians. You can get back to me next year. So that they may be so, but he's doing it so that we might be sanctified in truth, so that we can be in the world, not of the world. But for those who also believe in me through the word. So he's praying not only for the disciples, but he's praying this literally for you. Twice you show up in the Bible. How cool is that? All right, I'm going to the next one here. And I have made your name known to them and will make it known. This is the last one, by the way. I will make it made known to them so that the love which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Jesus is letting us know these things. Why? So that you may experience the love of God. I love it. It doesn't just end with this sense of, all right, I've given them their list. See you guys later. I'm going to go to heaven in a cloud, you know, cool little fly up to heaven thing. No, he's like, I know there's a mission to save the world, but I also want you to know the love of God yourself, to experience the love of God. There's an experientialness to Christianity, that, there's, that you're, you're meant to feel God's love in your heart, in your soul, in your mind. And Jesus is like, when you interact with Jesus, you cannot help but come to the, the gripping terms of what God's love is for you. And sometimes it's overwhelming, but it's there. You cannot experience Jesus without experiencing God's love. And I want to finish with this. As we go through this, this is, this is absolutely amazing. And you think about that list, every single one of those things on that list that started with the purpose clause. Blank, let's call it X. X happens so that Y happens. How much of you, what you need to do is in the column of X? None. None. This is insane. This is insane. God's not saying, you need to do this so that unity happens in the church. It doesn't say that. You need to do this so that people get saved. You need to do this so that you can experience peace. You need to do this so you can feel joy and purpose and the love of God. You need to do this so that you can see God and Jesus in all his glory. None of it. Who's doing all of it? Jesus is or God is. This is so insane because... A lot of centuries of church has been about what you need to do to get the why result. Now, there are some things in Scripture that do that. Paul loves doing that. He's like, hey, 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 you know, don't come to the communion table drunk so that you don't get sick. <laughs> he has a lot of purpose clauses where we have a part to play and there's a responsibility that we have in our holiness and our walk with the Lord. But Jesus here, as he's praying to God, is not once saying, I pray that they do this so that this happens. It's all about what God did. And when we come to Christmas, this would be an entirely different story if the Christmas story was, all right, I pray that Kevin will do this so that Jesus comes to save the world. No. There's nothing in this story that I have to do. It's already been done. So our, our, my heart for you this Christmas is that we don't camp on what we need to do, but we camp on what Jesus has already done. We have the benefit of living 2,000 years after Christmas, and we can see what he's done. We're not living 2,000 years before Christmas in the law that says, okay, I need to do this, 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 639 laws, whatever it is. Oh, man, what a Christmas gift that would be. Here's the law. Oh, man. But Jesus is like, no, here I've come to bring peace and freedom. I've done it. And the other stuff I'm praying about is that God does. So the responsibility is on Him. And so we just, what I love about it, it's not like, this is not a to-do list. It's an unlocking of perks list. I love perks. This is why membership constantly gets me about, not just not church, but just membership for like all sorts of stuff. Golf club membership, hey, you get a 5% discount. It just costs like $2,000. Dude, that sounds good. You know, I'll never get that value, but it sounds good. You know, uh, when they had the movie, when you had to rent movies from, like, Blockbuster and stuff before, you know, all that went away, you get like a, hey, you know, rent 10 movies, get the 
11th one free. I never rent movies, but I was like, man, that perks of getting that 11th one I'll never get free sounds good. I got these coffee club memberships that I don't even drink coffee. But I got these memberships things because it's just, I just think the value. And that, so this, this to-do, God doesn't have a to-do list. It's a perks benefit list. It means if you want peace, it's there. It's there for you if you want it. If you want have to, for salvation and evangelism to work, it's there. God's unlocked the ability to do that. If you want to be secure and safe, he's unlocked the ability to do that. Quote, unquote, safe on a, you know, on a spiritual level. It if you want to experience God's love, it doesn't say what you have to do. He's already done it. So that you, he's unlocked the ability for you to experience God's love today in this season. So meditate this week on John chapter 17. Lord, what do you have in here that's unlocked for me already? I don't have to do anything. I just got to know it and experience and be in that space. I hope you guys have a great Christmas. Uh, as we come to the end here, I want to pray for you and bless you as you go off into this next uh, time of holidays. Um, and come downstairs for morning tea afterward so we can keep on fellowshipping in unity, in, in practice, and in real life, uh, so that the world might see, so God is glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all these things that you have done. Lord, that throughout the, the millennia uh, ago, there was a, a big to-do list of other false gods. All these false gods had lists of things that we had to do to appease you. And God, you had a different way of doing it. There's nothing that could appease you except for yourself. And so you sent Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to appease the wrath of God. The purpose of Jesus' coming was so that we might be saved, so that you might be glorified. And so, Lord, I pray as we go into the next season that we have a big perspective of what our life is about, that we fit into this meta-narrative of this awesomeness of Jesus. And so we want to lift him up as he was a baby, as he lived his perfect life. We lift him up as he was on that cross dying for us. We want to praise his name and exalt him as he rose again. Christmas means nothing without Easter. And so we praise and say hallelujah that he rose from the grave, ascending to the throne. And, Lord, we pray that he will come back swiftly. We look forward to that day where we can be in heaven experiencing the glory of Jesus and what a day that will be. Until then, Lord, help us to live in the unlocks list that we are who you say we are, that we are children of God, and that we have the ability to experience your love and peace. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Kevin.